So now we're looking for the LCD. What is an LCD? Uh, it's just like the lowest common denominator. Lowest common denominator. And so what numbers am I looking at now? 20, 20. One of the things I really like about what Piper's doing is that she's asking lots of questions and not giving lots of answers. And she even mentions that at one point. She says, my job is to have them answer the questions, not me. Students become very reliant upon teachers for information. And we won't always be with them. And they need to understand that they're the source of the answers to their questions. I have a colleague who says, math is not a spectator sport. You didn't come here to watch me perform. I'm here to watch you perform. Do I multiply like this? Yeah. No. no. You want to multiply multiply I'm going to multiply straight across. I think when you're grouping students, as she is doing here, that you want to keep them about the size that she has shown, about three or four students. If the group is too small, it stops becoming a group, really. When it's just a couple of students, then the communication isn't the blessing to, to the other people that it would be in a larger group. On the other hand, if the group does become too large, one voice can tend to dominate it. When you have about four students per group, as she has done, everybody's voice matters in that group. I got 38,150 over 80. I must have did some serious... That's what I got the first time I did it. <laughs> we see in the tape two girls comparing answers and finding out that uh, whether they have the same answer or whether one of them is different, and then checking each other. So that's a good use of groups also. Another thing that I like about groups is that it allows the teacher the mobility that we don't normally have in a mathematics classroom. In an English classroom, you can tell the students it's free reading day, and then you can go help individual students. In math, you can't say, pick a fun page in the book and work on it while I work with individual students. There's no free math day. So cooperative grouping allows the teacher to move around a little bit and become more mobile and help individual students' needs. Did you multiply three times seven to get this? Yeah. Is that how we were supposed to do them? Mm -hmm. What did we have to do earlier? What did we do? One of the things that we see Piper doing as she moves around is she's also facilitating the listening and communication that's going on among her students. And that's almost an equally, if not more important, task than facilitating the mathematics. She's encouraging students to share their ideas with one another, and that's a very important benefit of these cooperative groups. He got $56.20, so what do you think we need to do? Articulating your thinking at the end of the lesson is a very important part of it, and that's one of the things that I like about what Piper does. Um, quite often we focus too much on just the answer to the math problem, and if we don't focus on that, we try to focus on the conceptual development, we diminish the answer. But you can see that throughout this process that she, val she values the, the process, the answer, and also the um, assessment of the answer, to, is it valid, and the communication of the methods. And, and in that last part, there's a number of things that happen that are good. One is that our brains, whether we're in a math class, an English class, or science class, is always processing through language. That's the number one way our brain uh, processes information. So we want to use language even in a math class. Research has also shown that periods of reflection and communication and summation at the close of a lesson really help to solidify the memory and the learning. And then another thing too is it's a great assessment tool for the teacher because at this point now she is able to see what her students have learned and see what they're thinking. And we can't always get that from a test that just involves numbers.